Good morning. This is Dixie Grunenfelder with the State Superintendent's Office. Thank you for joining us for the overview of the 2014 Dropout Prevention Survey Results and Next Steps webinar. Um, I know people will join us as we go along, but certainly we have very limited time because we only scheduled this for about um, a half an hour of presentation and 15 minutes of question and answers um, at the end at the end, excuse me, so I want to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us. I know this was kind of a quick turnaround on this webinar, but we really wanted to catch um, some of you district dropout coordinators oh, before coordinators school got out this year. Uh, uh, in the room, in the room here, here with me this morning is our team, our team of, of results, results, Washington, Washington State State dropout, dropout prevention. prevention. Um, individuals, and, and very quickly, very quickly I'm going to run through our list of people who have been, who have been working, working on this project, project with us. Kaylin Newell and B.G. Sandahl from, from the Governor's Office are here. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan Newell, Newell will be joining, be joining us shortly, but I have Mike Hubert, Hubert. Uh, Tim, Tim Stensberger has stepped out. out. I'm here. Brett Nelson, Brett Nelson is here. here. And more and more, and more, and more and in the controls of monitoring questions kind of running the show. So thank you for joining us. Quickly, the objectives of the webinar today are to provide a little bit of background um, on the dropout prevention, intervention, and re-engagement efforts that are happening um, at the state level and the work that we've been doing. Review those survey results of the survey that we did back in uh, December that the districts responded to, um, which we sent out the reports, but we just wanted to spend a few minutes to review those results. An overview, uh, a plan for next steps, and get um, some input for you or talk about how you might be involved in some of that work, and then respond to any questions. So starting off for foundation, um, the results Washington Goal 1 World Class Education around access is all Washingtonians have access to education that prepares them to transition to elementary, middle, high school, post-secondary career, and lifelong learning opportunities. And that's the big overarching goal. Um, we're working under a sub-goal, um, which is around increasing the graduation rate by two percentage points per year through 2018. Um, this aligns very nicely with Superintendent Dorn's second term education priority, the one that talks about improving academic achievement for all students and reducing dropout rates. So it was kind of a match made in heaven when Results Washington um, uh, started to look at the work they wanted to do and the, the work that we had started in GATE, and so the, the relationship continued. Um, very briefly, this is looking at the four-year graduation rates by race and ethnicity uh, for the last four years, just to give you an idea of what we're working on or what we've been, um, how successful we've been uh, trending, fairly stable. Um, across most groups right now for um, all students, four-year grad rates um, look at about 76 percent. Uh, just to note, the, the way we calculate some of these numbers have changed over time, and so um, some of the flexibility is because of that, and some of, the, some of it is because of the specific efforts going on. These are more four-year grad rates by subgroups like special education, bilingual, low income, title one migrant, male, female. So as you can see, there's quite a range when you start looking at specific groups underneath that graduation rate and, and the work that we're doing. Um, there has been substantial gains in our ability to look at the data, slice and dice it different ways to really get down to um, issues and concerns and, and really targeting efforts and of course, at the district level, and even more so at the building level, your data becomes much more um, finite and much more detailed. But even at the state level, we've, we've gotten better at, at doing, uh, being able to look at students. So um, the foundational kind of policy, um, the, the policy foundation for the work really started back in 2007 9 biennium with the Building Bridges um, legislation. Uh, it formed a Building Bridges work group, and many uh, groups out in the communities taking a look at the dropout issue. And the charge of that work was to make recommendations to the legislature on staffing levels, recommended staffing levels, as well as an action plan for 
what would it take to um, address the dropout issue in Washington State. And what came out of the Building Bridges work group were three key things. One was to set a statewide goal for student graduation and partner with youth serving agencies to coordinate the efforts to address those goals. So we still see that as a foundation for our work. Um, second was to build local dropout prevention intervention systems and practices, which we still have as our, one of our key efforts. And the third was to create a dropout reengagement system for 16 to 21 year old youth. So all these things have been going on. Um, number three, under the, under the um, direction of the Open Doors 1418 programs, many reengagement programs are opening up. So um, a lot of work going on underneath these legislative recommendations. Most recently, the work has been organized under the GATE Collective Impact Initiative out of OSPI. GATE stands for Graduation a Team Effort, and in following with the spirit of collective impact, there's five key elements of the work of GATE. One is to create a common vision around dropout and um, reduction and graduation rate increases across not just OSPI and the K-12 education system, but also across Department of Social and Health Services, Department of Health, um, at the regional level, at the local level, just creating a common vision of what is the problem and where do we need to be going. Um, we also have built backbone support. We have a backbone committee that sits here at OSPI that has representatives across state agencies and across youth serving organizations that kind of um, serve as the policy uh, committee, really reviewing things, making recommendations, um, serving as the sounding board for any efforts that go on here. Um, we've worked on creating shared outcome measures, which initially, as we engaged with our partners, were, um, were under the, the um, basis of milestone measures, if you've seen the gate milestone measures, but it really was to create unity across the different systems to say, how do we know we're moving the needle? What are things we need to be looking at as far as, um, you know, not necessarily data outcome measures, because some of the outcomes that we came up with didn't have data sources and we need to work on that, but how do we come up with common outcome measures across a broad spectrum, including um, early learning and pre-kindergarten, to um, ha what's happening in K-12 education, to what's happening in the community, and then what's happening post-secondary um, through employment and college and careers. So those milestone measures are broad. Some of them are a little bit vague at this point as we develop um, data sources. Certainly the school milestone measures were very easy to measure because we have assessment data, we have attendance data, we have behavior data. We've got a lot of data sources for that. Um, and even in the community, um, outcome measures, we did have healthy youth survey data that we rely on. Um, we spend a lot of time communicating, sharing messages, just being consistent with messaging. Um, we rely on our GATE website um, to do a lot of the communication work. Our communication specialist, Rhett Nelson, does newsletters, fact sheets, um, any, whenever we can, just trying to keep um, whatever's going on documented and shared with our partners. And then lastly, mutually reinforced activities. We've tried to look at what research says around what's effective in dropout prevention, intervention, and reengagement, and just try to be consistent um, in staying true to what research says, while we also look at what's successful in our state. So we know the districts in our state that are moving the needle in increasing graduation rates, and we keep a constant uh, finger on the pulse of what they're doing. Um, to try to see if there are things that we can glean from them and share with the greater um, population and, and efforts and just help guide work across the state. So I'll take a break there and see if we have any, no questions so far. Good. Sure. So I'm going to, uh, Kaylin has just offered to take the next slide, so. <laughs> Hello everybody, Kaylin Newell from Results Washington, uh, Office of the Governor. Results Washington, in case you have not heard of that, is uh, Governor Inslee's performance management system. Um, his goal number one is world-class education, and within that goal we have multiple uh, measures and things that we're looking at 
through the, the P20 systems, early learning all the way through post-secondary. Um, Alan Burke sits on our goal council and, and has been just a, just a vital part of, of doing this work. These are the two measures that we have on our um, radar, the graduation, to increase the graduation rate by two percentage points per year through 2018, as Dixie had mentioned earlier, and then to increase the availability and access of dropout prevention programming um, by students and families. And that was really the catalyst for the dropout survey that was submitted um, in December, which is why we wanted to gather you folks today to share some of the results of that. So thanks for letting me cut in. Dixie, back to Dixie. Okay, thanks. So we'll jump right into doing some survey highlights. I just looked over at Mike Hubert and asked if he wanted to cover this because he really was the lead on the survey um, when it went out in December, but uh, he graciously turned it back over to me. So <laughs> the survey highlights, which again was included in the report that we sent to you all, but um, we'll cover uh, just one slide of, or a couple slides of the basics. So we were very pleased with the response rate. Out of the 295 districts, we had 230 that completed the survey, um, which was very impressive and gave us a great foundation um, for the work that we're doing now. Um, we included questions on the survey that, again, are kind of the key components of a dropout prevention intervention reengagement system, just kind of, again, to check the, the uh, pulse of what's happening relative to what research says are the key elements. So, um, first thing we asked was, is there a district point of contact? Is there someone in your district that's kind of assigned to tracking dropout um, or graduation kind of um, activities efforts? And 76% of districts say, yes, they have a person identified and actually included their name and email, and probably that's how you got uh, invited to this webinar. Um, when we got into a little more detail about does your district have a dropout reduction goal or a graduation goal? Um, only 44% of districts says, says, say that they have a specific dropout um, and or graduation goal. And of those, 30% um, of them said that their goal is 100% graduation. All children succeed. So um, kind of a philosophical goal as opposed to a SMART goal that says, you know, we're going to increase graduation by two percentage points per year and, you know, uh, and breaking it down that way. But only 44, which um, was a little bit low, we thought, um, for that uh, measure. Um, we also asked how many districts had early warning systems to identify students um, early and get them placed in uh, appropriate intervention services. And 86% of districts said they had some type of early warning system. But as you might suspect, um, most of that was focused on secondary ed and specifically high school um, students and tracking those students. Um, but we were pleasantly surprised to see, um, of course, because research says students start disengaging and, quotes, dropping out um, in early grades, 31% of districts said that they had their system across their K-12 continuum. So they really were looking at some of those early warning indicators in elementary school, um, and then 63% only looked at um, secondary grades, and then 90% only focused on high school. So um, we, we really want to um, look at those numbers and, and focus on those districts that have the K-12 systems and, and trying to share that knowledge of increasing early warning earlier. Um, when we got down to system components for dropout prevention, intervention, and reengagement. we asked a couple questions. We asked about a multi-tiered system of support. So we wanted to know, oh, sorry. So we wanted to know um, how many schools had that, you know, tier one prevention, tier two intervention, tier three case management, high intense services. And of districts, 30% of districts said they have a defined multi-tiered system of support, including all levels of supports. 36% um, of districts uh, reported that they market their student support programming and services to students and families um, through various um, methods, usually a newsletter, a website, um, included in the student handbook, some of those kind of typical ways of communicating with parents and students. 
but 36% are informing students and families that there are supports available. 60% of districts reported collaborating with community partners, which is great. I'm happy to see that collaboration. And we did ask a little bit more detail about who those community partners were, and um, we had kind of a list. And, and a lot of those partnerships were centered around after-school programming, like Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCAs, mental health providers, health providers, chemical dependency treatments or substance abuse providers, so kind of your typical um, services, support services that are definitely needed by many students that the school obviously wouldn't provide. Well, before so. Dixie leaves this slide, I think one of the, uh, the indicators about the marketing of these services and programs, you know, if we're going to uh, see an increase in parent access and student access, to the programming that we make available in prevention and early intervention, um, that certainly is not a strong number to represent that there's an intent around uh, connecting uh, uh, families with the program in prevention. So that's something we want to look at really closely and uh, identify some of those outliers that are doing that body of work. Clearly, uh, more than a third um, see importance around that. Great. We do have a question. So I'm going to bounce back to, sorry, um, we had a question about early warning indicators and in the systems um, that were put in place, and specifically, what are some of those early warning indicators? And of course, the standard that you hear a lot about are the attendance, behavior, and credits or courses, so the ABCs. Um, some districts, very few, mentioned some additional indicators that they look like, they look at almost some intervening variables like health, mental health, um, family, engagement, um, and they had measurement tools to, to measure those, what they consider to be pretty high, um, high uh, highly uh, impactful indicators on students dropping out. So we didn't get into the detail about how the district selected their uh, indicators. Um, some probably did extensive longitudinal cohort studies to figure out the kids that dropped out, what did they look like at the earlier grades so that they were tracking those. Um, some probably looked at research and took the ABCs and knew there was enough you know, theoretical foundation to just use um, some of those. Um, setting the threshold, like how many absences? Are we talking excused or unexcused? And some of those kind of questions probably came out of you know, district process work and city work and things that they had done over time with their partners. We asked a question about what are the biggest challenges facing districts, and they really ended up kind of grouping themselves into four areas. I think number one um, came up as far as supports for kids around mental health and substance abuse, really seeing a huge um, uh, impact of these issues on not just the students but the families and just the lack of capacity and community resources to deal with those problems. Districts shared those um, many times over. Um, there was also a consistent um, communication around um, lack of staffing to support uh, students and families in need. So you have an early warning system and you identify the problems and then just the lack of support in dealing with those problems. So, how to, how to deal with that. Um, many districts talked about limited community resources, and this especially came up when some of our rural districts, just about, you know, we identify, let's use example, mental health or substance abuse, and then we don't have a provider um, that's within 100 miles. Um, and so that really taxes the school in figuring out what to do when those issues are identified. And lastly, a very um, consistent and common theme around lack of family engagement, just having a hard time getting families to, communi to commit to, you know, getting kids to school, making sure that they were engaged, and um, having them participate in the process. So those were the four major challenges. Lots of detail, again, under those, and they're in the report. Um, when we asked about training needs for districts, um, these, this is what um, many of you talked about wanting to learn more about what's working to prevent dropout in other districts. So 
what, what do people seem to be doing across what we talked about as the core components of a system, but specifically, and, and specifically to Washington State and, and the kids in our state. They wanted to know about um, more about the impact of out-of-school life on academics. So knowing it's a huge issue, but also how are you know how to deal with that and how does it show up at school and and um, more about that because um, districts often talked about feeling like they had the the school system in place, but but the out-of-school environment um, ends up being kind of disruptive. So. Um, Many of you mentioned how to motivate the unmotivated student. So having students that don't have a vision or don't care. And so you can provide all the services you, that you want, but if the fish aren't biting, it's hard to do that. So how to motivate students. Um, some talked about adult mindset and just creating that expectation of staff and parents and community members that all students can succeed. And, um, and creating that feeling of success for everybody. And then wanting specific parent engagement strategies. So knowing that that's a critical need, knowing that it's a problem that often gets in the way, but not sure what to do about that and wanting more information about that. And not just at elementary school, but in middle and high school too. Um, some of that. So um, when we talk um, we took all the information from the survey, and Kaylin and her partner at the time, Jill, traveled across the state, and many of us at OSPI are out on a daily basis talking with districts and superintendents and principals, and um, it summarized all together into what were the issues, what were the concerns, what, was, what seemed to be working, um, and we, we kind of boiled it into um, four areas where we saw opportunities for some work that could be done and um, a way to organize the work that needs to happen in the coming months, years, decades, really. So um, we've created a, a kind of a plan um, looking at four areas. Um, I'll start with data. Um, there were many concerns around having access to the data that you need, being able to uh, analyze that data and use it in a way that is impactful for student achievement and student success and creating those multi-tiered systems of support. So I think we've got some work to do around data. We've got some work to do around the school system. So setting up those multi-tiered systems of support and um, organizing the magnitude of initiatives and things that need to be done within a school um, so that it can be as efficient and as effective as, as possible in, in meeting the needs of all kids, um, certainly this last 20% that are having a hard time getting to the finish line. We need to do some work with students and creating that sense of belonging and that you know hope for the future um, and really getting their buy-in and seeing that this is their uh, educational journey. And then lastly, the adult support, so looking at that caring adult for every child, um, all children can succeed, that kind of philosophical belief um, in the work and supporting students. Um, specifically around some of those things, um, we saw a lack of process related to identifying students at risk and monitoring their progress. So that goes back to the early warning systems. Um, we hear a lot that there are early warning systems, but that sometimes is where it ends. So you've got a system, you can identify the kids, but, it, but the process that needs to be in place to really look at that data, assign interventions, progress monitor those. Um, so taking that to the next level. Um, we certainly know that there's a lack of access and availability of resources um, for creating that multi-tiered system of support. Um, we know there's social, emotional, physical, and health issues that need to be attended to within the school, but then also through partnerships with our community. We need to work on student engagement, and we need to work on the caring adult piece. So more detail on the kind of things we see um, that need to be addressed. So the big question, what can you do and how can you help in your role as your identified district dropout coordinator, um, or if you're just an interested party that's participating in the webinar today, we've got a couple things. Um, we were hoping that the district dropout coordinator 
really becomes our conduit to what's going on in the district to hear about what's going on uh, ongoing. What are the issues? What are the barriers? What is working? As, and then we'll, we can also share with you what we're learning uh, in our work in working with other districts, in research, in state level and national level projects. So um, we're just going to create, hopefully, this um, dialogue with you. And you're going to share, and we're going to share, and we're going to make a great team. There are specific action groups that are being set up or already exist to, to work on some of the issues that we've identified in the webinar. Uh, we have the Gate Backbone Committee that are going to look at some of the system issues around the safety nets for students and families, specific to mental health and substance abuse, trying to expand those resources in communities and um, try to solve some of those problems. We have a data committee that's going to look at some of the early warning indicator work and, and try to inform some of, those, some of that work around just how to look at data and what to do with it once you have it. And, um, just making sure we're making data-informed decisions. Um, we currently have a multi-tiered system of support statewide advisory committee that meets quarterly, and we're going to charge uh, that group to do some of the work around um, what we identified as that, um, as that support system for kids and families, um, how we might market that more effectively, what things need to be in place, uh, and how, how to deal with that whole system. We're going to start two new groups. One is a student engagement committee, and the other is an adult engagement committee. Uh, and really starting, uh, from, I wouldn't say from scratch, because there's certainly been a lot of research and work done in those areas, but really kind of do an environmental scan of what's going on with student engagement, adult engagement, try to boil that down into things that are usable by districts and schools, and, and then get that information out and do some work in those areas. Specifically, there's a couple ways that we see um, for you to get involved. Um, I would suggest if you haven't been to the GATE webpage off the OSPI website, that you take a minute to visit that webpage. It contains a lot of information for students and families, for educators, for community members. It tracks all of this work that we're doing in addition to other state level policy uh, system level work. Um, try to put lots of resources there. Um, presentations from other districts on what's working. So um, visit the web page if you can. Um, you can share your results with others, and that includes us. We have a uh, dropout prevention intervention reengagement program inventory that's on the website where you can record some of the things you're doing so that we can share that with other people. Um, we are going to form some focus groups over the summer around some of these specific topics that we need to uh, gain information on. So that information will go out to all the district contacts. If it seems to be something you might be interested in participating in, um, please join a focus group. And um, I encourage you to, to participate in ongoing surveys as we move forward, because we're only as good as the information that we have. And, and we really see you as viable in, in that, that endeavor and meeting your feedback and your perspective on this work. I mentioned those couple of action teams that are that are starting and some that are already in existence. Uh, I encourage you if that's an area you're interested in working on in your district or across the state to join one of those groups and share with us what's working. Um, specifically, we have a Gate Partnership Advisory Committee meeting coming up on June 10th uh, here in Olympia at the ESD 113 from 9 to noon. Uh, it's going to be a great um, presentation. It's focused on graduation and post-graduation success. Superintendent Dorn will be there along with the Lieutenant Governor, along with the new um, CEO of College Success Foundation, a Director of a Workforce Development Council, um, we, and Deb Kane will be there to talk about graduation rates and some new numbers. So it's a great program and it would be a good introductory um, meeting for you to come to to learn about what's going on in that area. And to meet other like-minded individuals who have made a priority around this. Thank area. you. Yeah. Very true. The, the meeting, we attract you know 75 folks that, that come together. And the networking that happens at those meetings is pretty impressive. I agree. This is our plan for the fall moving forward. Again, appreciate your uh, quick response to participate in this webinar today. 
Um, but our plans for the fall is to do an ongoing monthly webinar on a specific topic that's been identified through the survey. So, so you know, we'll have one on early warning systems. We'll have one on parent engagement. And, and the survey at the end of this webinar, we ask you what kind of topics you'd like to see covered in that webinar series. And so um, we're just going to have a standing webinar once a month at a certain date and time, and we'll present. And certainly we'll record those and post those. Um, we're going to be doing some check and connect trainings in the fall. We're building capacity during the summer around a training of trainers. So if you have folks that work in kind of that graduation coach, student success coordinator role in your district, um, these check and connect trainings will be happening throughout the state uh, this fall. We have a conference coming up. Kaylin, do you want to talk about the conference? Yeah, October 27, 28 at the Washington Educators Conference. Uh, held at CPAC, and it's, it's actually um, going to be around graduation. Uh, Governor Inslee is going to be the, the final keynote speaker. Uh, we're going to offer a lot of breakout sessions that will have um, interesting information that, that we will have your um, counterparts in other districts sharing some of the things that they've learned, some of the, the, the tools they use, some best practices that they um, that they've had and just a way to really connect with them and network with them. So be watching for that um, October 27th and 28th. Put a big hold on your calendar. Yeah. It's where everyone's going to be, right? <laughs> it's the social, it's the social, dropout social event of the year. Um, uh, another exciting project we have going is the Dropout Early Warning and Intervention System Toolkit that was developed through the work of Building Bridges this year that we'll be um, sharing with folks in the fall and implementing that and getting it out for you to use as a tool as you do the work in your districts. We will continue to focus on multi-tiered system of supports implementation. Uh, here at OSPI, we're going after a couple very large grants, so keep your fingers crossed. One of them specific around um, developing multi-tiered system of support, uh, statewide capacity, regional capacity, uh, district. So, some great work that's going to be happening <clears throat> coming up in the fall. So we saved a few minutes here at the end for any questions or comments that you have, if you want to type them in the box, uh, your chat box. Also, if you take a moment to fill out our survey gizmo to give us feedback on this webinar, in addition to what you'd like to see in the future coming up in the fall, we'd love your input on that. Um, if after this webinar you have uh, additional questions or you want more information about anything we talked about today, I've listed our group email address, team effort at k12.wa.us, that you can participate in, that you can send us messages to. So are there any last questions, comments from the room here, from our presenters? Did we? We'll give people a minute to post. We're watching the posting questions, but I opened it up here in the room if there was any additional announcements you want to make about things or. Well, I think we want to encourage you to visit the website. We know that we just uh, in the last 24 hours we released a, our most recent newsletter that kind of brings you up to date on some of the things that occur. Uh, and so we would want you to, to really uh, dig deep there where you can find out about a lot of the different things that we're doing. It's just a very excellent site. And feel free to forward uh, any communication from us on this channel to forward to others in your, uh, within your district. We know the district identified a person, but maybe you have people in your uh, middle schools, high schools, even, even your elementary schools that would benefit from participating in the webinar or uh, being informed about the efforts that we're doing here um, at, on the state level. I'd say on that include, you know, your community partners too. If you've got good, valuable partners in your community, you know, encourage them to join our group. Encourage, um, you know, that participation. The more they can understand the value of graduation goals, um, the better they'll be able to communicate it to your community as well. We would like for the intervention. So. We have a question. Hang on one second. Or a comment. Uh, are there any dates set for the check and connect training? 
There are no dates set yet. What I know is that we're going to be doing the training of trainers over the summer. So we're going to build capacity to have trainers actually located in our state. Those will be throughout the state. Um, we're going to build regional capacity, which then should hopefully increase the frequency of those trainings and lower the cost. Because as you know, in the past, we had to have University of Minnesota come out and do those trainings, and they were $500 plus dollars every time you'd attend. So hopefully, our hope is that we're going to build the state capacity this summer. And, and then as part of those trainer certification processes, they have to offer a couple trainings. So that's what you're going to see in the fall is those trainers becoming certified under the direction of University of Minnesota. And then um, in the, throughout the fall, winter, spring, um, we'll get as many of those trainings out as possible. As soon as we get those dates set, though, I'll let you know. And then this one, we would like for the interventions that work to be shared. We also want to look at the implementation of them. OK, so there was a comment about wanting to know what works and the sharing of the implementation. And that is one of our key goals here is, is to boil down what's working, the elements, why they're working, and be able to articulate and share that message. So um, we have a, a group of districts that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, seem to have found a recipe that works. Um, and we're trying to look for commonalities across those districts and those components and sharing those. But we also know that it, within a district, there might be a component here, a component there. It might not be the whole system that's been put in place yet, but there's been unique um, or specific interventions that are working. And through that, um, I mentioned on the GATE website, that tool where you can register what's working, we're collecting those best, they're not best practices, but those promising approaches in that database. So we'll continue to promote um, getting interventions into that database. Or some folks have interventions, but it's the application in PD that support correct use. Are there models of PD out there for us to use as examples? You want me to talk? About yeah, I'm going to have Tim talk a little bit about the work we're doing with Dr. Dean Fixon here around implementation science, and I think that really is the key to right. that. Right, and I think you're you're hitting the nail on the head because this. Just because you have check and connect doesn't mean it's going to work. It's the implementation. So I think we're going to have to analyze the programs that should be working. The evidence is clear that it would work, but it's the implementation of the program that that is struggling. And so we'll help. That our intent is to help districts with implementation science using some of Dean Fixon's work, so that as they're providing the professional development, they can monitor the progress of the implementation of the program along the way to make sure that the fidelity is there. Yeah, and I think most of when we're implementing professional development here, for example, the Check and Connect, we're, we're trying to follow the implementation science to say build capacity for coaching, ongoing technical assistance support, ongoing assessment of the delivery of that program with fidelity, you know, kind of all that work that needs to happen after you go to the training and come back and start doing the work. Anything else? Looks like that's the end of the comments. And thank you so much again for joining us. Um, we're happy to have this first one under our belt and looking forward to the fall. Um, we'll look for the survey gizmo comments and suggestions that you all provide in setting that the agenda for those webinars um, in the fall. So. And again, this has been recorded and will be posted. We will post it on the GATE website. To share with your colleagues. And we will be in touch after this uh, around those focus groups and some opportunities over the summer to continue to stay involved and participate in, in some of our ongoing activities. So thank you. Thank you.